All right, I think we're back. So, sorry for the delay. Um, <clears throat> so let's keep moving. Oh, question, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, what's that? Is the slide up on the website? Oh, is it not up? I don't know. Hold on. This is going really well for me so far today. Uh, if it's not up, I can make it appear. Let's see, count me, time me. How long does this take? Uh, lectures today. There's that. Wait, is it not? Do you not see it? When you guys go to my website, do you not see it? How about now? Is it up now? <laughs> All right, there it is. So that should be. Sorry, something wrong? If you refresh, is that okay? Yeah, something else wrong? Yeah, what's up? Question is uh, the one where I say hi plus there, the second bullet, the, the string s equals hi, and then I do s plus equals there. Yep. So whenever you take any sort of literal string in quotes, that by nature is an old style string. That means it's bad, it doesn't work well, it doesn't support concatenation, it doesn't support methods like length, substr, find, any of that. It doesn't have any of those things because it's the old kind of string. But the moment you store it into a variable of type string, that type, that string type is the new C++ type for string. And when you take the old type of string instead of equal and put it into a new type of string variable, it performs an implicit conversion that turns it into the good new C++ type of string. So the moment we do that line, string s equals pi, it's a good string. So now that you can take plus equals there. And new kind of string plus old kind of string, it knows how to do that the right way. Or new string plus new string works as well. Yeah, question? So there's no way to store an old type of string? You can store an old type of string in a variable. You have to write care star. I don't want to talk about that too much because that's, that's usually not what you want to do in our class. But you can store them. It's just we mostly want to not use them in that form. OK, anyway, sorry about all the disruption and all the crashing and stuff. Fingers crossed I don't have another outage. Um, <coughs> I wish I could blame this on Mac somehow. <laughs> Except I run, I run Linux, so it doesn't make any sense. But most things are Apple's fault. Um, anyway, OK, so look, I'm not going to spend a lot more time on the C strings. The main thing I want you to take away from this is that there are some weird things you might see where you're doing what seem to be innocent type of things in your code, but you get a very strange result. And if that happens, I just kind of want this little uh, light bulb to go on and goes, wait a minute, I think Marty told me there were some weird things about these two kind of strings. Maybe go look at these slides, double check if you're doing that in your code, and if so, maybe try to avoid it, you know, try to come up with a different pattern. And I think the sort of number one thing you can do to avoid this weird stuff is to just, whenever you're using a string, just maybe store it in a string variable if you're going to do any kind of manipulations to the string. Don't try to manipulate a string in quotes, manipulate a variable that stores a string. That's the number one thing you can do, I think, to avoid weirdness in your, in your program. <laughs> OK, so having said that, I want to advance to some new stuff. I want to talk about my slides for today. Uh, yeah, also, I think, I think maybe your question was about where are these slides. And I was looking at slides from last lecture, from Wednesday, up until this moment. That's why maybe it was hard to, to find them. Those are the Wednesday slides. So now I'm starting Friday slides. I'm going to teach you about reading files. Reading files is done through an object called a stream. So I mean, I'm assuming you've looked at data, you've read data from a file or some other source. Before now, I just want to kind of show you how you do that in C++. And then after that, I want to talk about how to use a data structure called a, a grid and a vector. So there is a library you can include. You see those angle brackets? So you know it's a system library. It's called fstream. That's short for file stream. Inside that library, there are two classes that you can use called ifstream and offstream. That stands for input file stream and output file stream. These are objects that allow you to pull bytes in and out of a file. Uh, we talk about streaming the bytes like they flow from one place to another. You can read a line and read another line and so on. Um, technically, all these different streams are in this category called an inheritance hierarchy, but I'm going to talk about inheritance later in the class. Basically, these are all related data types that have similar operations that you can perform. If you want to look up all the different methods and things, you can look at the C++ uh, documentation and, and read about them in more detail. I'm going to show you a few of their methods that I think we could use to read files in this class. So uh, if you make a, a file stream, you can open a given file, 
And then once you open it, there are some various methods to read data out of the file. And then when you're done, you can close it. There's also some methods you can ask, like, have I reached the end of the file yet? And did I fail to open the file? There's some different things like that that you could do. The ones in blue are the ones I think you'll use the most, okay? So I think looking at this is not super helpful. I think seeing an example is more helpful. So let me show you a slide with an example. Here's a pretty typical example of reading a file. You include that fstream library. You declare a variable of type if stream, and then you tell it that you want to open something. You want to open poem.txt. If you just write a file name in there, it'll go to the same directory that your, your code is running in. So in our project, that's probably how we would say it. But you could also put a path like slash something slash poem.txt if you want to. Um, now the file is being read from that document. And then the way that you actually read the data out of the file, this looks a little different probably than Java or JavaScript or whatever. You declare a variable named line, and then you say while get line, print this line. So what this line of code, what this loop here is doing is it's reading lines from the input and it's storing them in that variable. That looks kind of weird, doesn't it? That, that loop, the way that, that code is constructed. Like, what do you know about this get line function and its parameters based on the style of that code on the screen? <coughs> what kind of parameters are those, do you think? In the back, what do you say? The line is being passed by reference. It's one of these output parameters. Like, we made a joke about dating ranges or quadratic equation groups where you pass in the parameter so the function can store something in it. That's what we're doing there. The line's empty. But when the input reading uh, get line function grabs a line out of the file, it puts it into our variable. So that when the function returns, the variable has the information in it. So it's basically a return in a different form. So, okay, that's right. What else do I know about the get line method? I mean, you, look at what I've written. I said while get line. So what does that mean about the get line method? Or what is its return type? What do you think? Yeah. It's Boolean. Yeah, it's basically returning true if it was able to read a line successfully and false if it wasn't. So basically the loop will read the line and store it in that line variable and return true, or it will fail to read the line and return false, in which case the loop will stop repeating. So kind of a weird piece of code, but that's how you do file reading in, uh, in C++. I think in a lot of languages you sort of open the file reading object and then you say something like, while there are more lines, String line equals read line or something like that. And it's a little different form. But this is kind of the same idea, reading a line at a time. Okay. Uh, another thing that looks a little different than other languages, like where I say if stream input, input.open, that looks a little different than something like Java. You might say equals new if stream. You know, in Java, when you create objects, you don't just declare them with a type and a name. You also have to say like equals new something. Well, C++, you don't do that. <laughs> you just say the type and the name. Semicolon. Now I have an object. It's there. I've made it. So it's ready to use. Now I open something with it. Just a little different syntax that we have here. Yeah. So Java, if you're not able to open a file, you have to work by passing. If this file is able to open, what does it do? Yeah, his question is uh, what if I try to open the file and it doesn't work? How do I know that it failed? Um, do it. In Java, you do a try catch, including some other languages as well. How do I check for those errors here? Um, I'll show you that. I think uh, coming up in a slide or two, I'll answer that. There's, a, there's basically a way you can ask whether the file failed to open. Yeah. But anyway, this is kind of the reading a file uh, pattern. So let me go to my Qt creator here. I've got a file here called uh, readfile.cpp. And then I also have in this project under other files, I have this resource folder that I have some different files in. So like I have the Gettysburg address, I have some Lewis Carroll, uh, you know, through the looking glass type of stuff. So if I wanted to read this, I could include fstream, and then I could do something like, you know, uh, uh, string line, actually I guess I gotta open the file first, if stream input, you can call it whatever you want, input.open carol.txt if I wanna read that file that I just looked at. Now while I'm able to get a line from that input and put it in the line variable. Oh, I gotta declare a line before that, right? I will do C out, you know, here is a line, colon, line, endl. So something like that. Oops, I don't think I remembered my little uh, squiggly operators here, my alligator. So now I run this and it says, here's a line and it prints each line one at a time 
that I'm reading out of the out of the file, right? So there's all kinds of stuff you could do with this, right? Like if you just want to count the number of lines in the file, you say like int lines equals zero, and then in here you say lines plus plus, and then you know see out there were lines total lines, right? Something like that, right? There's all kind of stuff that you could do with files. That's a pretty simple thing. You just count the number of lines and so on, right? Um, you, uh, now, you mentioned, like, what if the file doesn't exist? So what if I wrote in, like, carel.txt and I spelled it wrong? Then what you'll see is there, there were zero total lines. So the program doesn't, like, crash. Some languages like Java, if you try to open a file that doesn't exist, the whole program, like, explodes and your, your hard drive starts melting or whatever. And I think the computer starts automatically mining Bitcoin for you or something. I don't know. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I thought about that. I was like, I should make the class website auto mine Bitcoin when they go to it. I'll be rich. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not smart enough to get that working. But anyway. Um, Right now what it does is if, you, if you're unable to open the file, then when you try to read a line from the file, it just immediately fails, so my loop just never really enters, right? But how I would check that is there's a, um, there's a method called fail, <laughs> which is a Boolean, like, did the last thing that you tried to do to the file fail? So I can say, like, if the input is in a failed state, then I could say, you know, womp, womp, or whatever. I could reprompt. I could, there's all kind of stuff I could do, right? But if it didn't fail, I could try to read the lines of the file like that. So I think carel.txt will say womp womp. <laughs> and then if I spell it the right way with an O, um, it'll read the stuff out of the file, right? So that's kind of the answer to your, to your question. Um, OK, so anyway, that's a pretty common style for reading a line at a time. There's another line, another style that people sometimes write like this. They go, well, while it hasn't failed yet, read a line and print it. And that mostly works, except it has a small bug. And I think it's too subtle to really know if you haven't tried this before. But basically, the bug is that um, fail returns true if the last thing you tried to do was unsuccessful. So if you think about it for a few minutes, what you'll realize is that this piece of code will loop one time too many. Because like the very, very last time through the loop, when you're done with the whole file, you, like you read the very last line and you break it. So far, so good. You wrap around, as the last thing I did failed to know, uh, the last thing I did was I read a line and it's fine. So you jump in here again, you try to call get line and it isn't one. But then it prints like nothing. So it prints like a blank line at the end that shouldn't be there. Or depending how you write the code. Basically, it loops one time too many if you write the code in this way. Pretty common thing students write. I guess what I would just say, if you're reading lines, just really copy this template, this format for how to read them. Okay? Use get line as your loop test. Don't use fail or end a file as your loop test. Yeah? In Java, if you break out of y, can you do that here? Sure, yeah. Uh, suggestion how to fix this. You could say if get lines false, uh, break. That would fix the issue. That's also fine. I think I like my version better, but I, I think that's also fine in terms of it working and being correct. Yeah. Yep. But like if you're counting the number of lines, you need to make sure you don't loop too many times because your count would be off by one and stuff like that, right? Okay, so that's how to read lines. Um, if you want to read less than a line, if you want to read just a token of input, a word, we talk about tokenizing input sometimes. That means looking for blank spaces and slicing up the input that's between blank spaces. Blank spaces could be literally space characters, it could be tabs, it could be line breaks, anything. Any combination of those is called white space separation. So here's an example of a data file that says Marty is 12 years old and it's all kind of spaced out funny. So if you open a file, instead of using get line, you can actually use the uh, greater than greater than operator to read things from the input and store them into a string variable and it'll read a word at a time instead of a line at a time. So input arrow word, reads a word, stores it in that variable. So it gets Marty and then I do it again and I get is, I do it again. This time I do it using an int variable. Notice that, I say input arrow age. So it actually reads the next token of input, converts it into an int for me, and puts it into that variable. If the input's next token is not something you could treat as an int, if it was like a word or something else, it'll fail and it'll just leave it as a zero. But it'll read the next token either way. And then I keep reading some more tokens. You'll notice when I do the second to last one, it actually reads in the apostrophes because they're part of that token. They're part of the non-white space content of that token. So that's a way that you can read the 
words. Um, one other interesting thing is the sort of overall operation of like stream read into a variable. That whole expression turns into like a value that you can use as a Boolean. So you can actually use it as an if test or a while test. So there's actually a similar format of this last loop that I had where um, instead of lines, what if I were going to count words? And so uh, what if instead of line I called this token or something? So I read into the token. By the way, do you see how I did that? How did I do that? I'm so cool. Word like, whoa, I can change the name. If you hit shift control R, it renames something. Um, uh, anyway, if you say token, how did I, how did I learn that? I didn't, I'm not magical. I just right click and there's like a refactor, rename. You can find hotkeys for things up in here if you look at these menus. Um, so anyway, if you, instead of get line, if you say while input arrow token, that basically means while I am successful reading another token of input from the input, continue going. So uh, it says, beware the jabberwock, my son. Notice the little commas are, are on the words, right? And it's, it says 22 total lines. It should say total words. But that's me reading the input a word at a time. And it doesn't care how many spaces are between the words. Like if I come in here and I say, whoa. Jub, jub, bird, and shun. You know, if you put different things in here, you know, like that, it doesn't break it. I change the spacing, it still has the 22 words because it just jumps past all the white space, right? Okay. Yes? What does the greater, greater sign mean? It's called the stream extraction operator. You can use it on CIN. You can use it on a file. It means like pull data from that place and put it as reference into that uh, variable that's on the right. So extract one piece of data, whether it's a token or an int or whatever, and store it in that memory location for that variable, basically. It's kind of opposite of C out, where we have uh, less than, less than. It's like send information out somewhere. Uh, yeah, Christian. If it was only a quotation, do you mean like if I if I had a thing like here that was just like like that, and then I just had a dollar sign or whatever, and then I had this or whatever? Like, what do those do? Yeah, it'll treat each of those things as a word because it just looks for a sequence of characters that has white space around it, and that sequence becomes the token. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. Back to the slide. You bet. If I hadn't done int age, if, I had, if, if you cross out for int age and the input age, instead in its, in its place, if you just put input uh, arrow word, what would happen would be it would read 12, but it would be the string, quote, 12. And so it would store that 12 as a string with the characters 1, 2. Right, so I think, I think it gets tricky when the data format doesn't match what you're trying to do. So like if I had instead said um, uh, int token, then I think what you see is that it tries to read the first token of the file, which is beware, and it tries to return that to me as an int, and it's unsuccessful. So it doesn't modify that int variable, and the sort of Boolean of the this test says that failed, so I'm going to be a false, and so the while loop stops. So basically, if you try to read in the wrong way, it's unsuccessful and your operation just fails, basically. So my loop that's based on that succeeding will stop running. You, if you wanted it to skip over or something, what you'd have to do is you'd have to read each one as a string, and there's a method in our library called string is integer. So you'd have to say, well, if this thing could be turned into an int, then I'll say int n equals integer or string to integer token. And then I'll say uh, uh, the int token is n. So like uh, if I go back to the file, the where the 42 jabber rocks, my son, the seven jaws that bite, the 19 claws that catch, whatever, right? So now. Oops, what did I do? String is integer and string to integer are not found. What do you think's wrong? 
to include something. I think it's from Sterlib. You might say, geez, how do I keep all these libraries straight? Don't worry, if I give you a homework, I already include all the stuff for you, it's okay. Um, so up here it says, hey, the int token is 42. So it's, it's able to tell which tokens are ints and which ones aren't ints, right? Question, yeah. Yeah, what if the delimiter isn't white space? Um, I forget how to do that. <laughs> There's like a way to do it, and I never use it. Uh, if you want to split on things other than white space, we actually have a method you can call called string split. And you take the string and the delimiter, and it'll return a list of the tokens. So what I do is I just read the whole line using this string thing, and then I call string split on the line, and then I get a group of all the pieces. So I just use this when I want to split on spaces, and if I want to split on something that's not spaces, I don't try to bend this to do that. I use this other splitting method. Uh, we don't need string split today, but that's how I would do it. Yeah. When you're reading a file token by token, is there still a way to check to the end of a line, or does it one? If you're reading token by token, you sort of lose the meaning of the white space. So you don't actually know where the line breaks are. If you care where the line breaks are, you should read line by line. And then you say, well, but within the line, I want the tokens. There are ways you can make a stream that reads just a line, or you can loop over the characters of the line one by one using a for loop and grab bracket i and look at the characters that way. So if you want the line breaks, but you also care about the contents of the line, looking at them, you can do these kind of combination approaches like that. OK, um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on reading files, because I think in general, the idea of reading something sequentially and looking at the pieces is something you should have seen before. Um, here's some methods for reading files. I don't want to go over these right now, but there's methods for like creating and testing directories and deleting files, and there's, there's methods that help you with file-related stuff. There's also a file exists. Like I showed you that example where I checked if it failed with it opening. I could avoid even opening the file incorrectly by asking if the file exists first, and then I don't have to wait for it to fail. So there's different things you can do. Um, I want to talk now, for the rest of the lecture, I want to talk about collections. We're going to spend next week in detail talking about collections. I'm assuming that you guys coming into this class have used collections a little bit to store data. So when I say collection, I mean like an array, an array list, a hash map, something, a dictionary, a just some kind of way that you're storing multiple pieces of data in one thing, one variable. I'm assuming you've seen that before. If you haven't, I want you to go read chapter five and get familiar with that concept. I mean, basically a collection is one object that stores potentially multiple elements of data. Sometimes you call it a data structure. The things that you store inside the collection are called the elements of the collection. Um, in C++, there is a library of collections that comes with the language. It's called the Standard Template Library, STL. It's pretty powerful. It does a lot of cool stuff. The people who built this course, which precedes me um, here at Stanford, they decided that this built-in set of collections was hard for students to learn. It didn't give you very good error messages if you did something wrong. It had certain things that were easy to cause crashes and bugs. They felt it wasn't very good for learners. So we made our own set of collections here at Stanford, which we called the Stanford C++ library, the SPL instead of STL, because that's not confusing at all. Um, and we have our own collections, and we want to use those in this course. And um, some people have a strong reaction when they hear this information. And they say, I don't want to learn Stanford stuff. I want to learn real C++ stuff. And I sympathize with that mindset. But I guess what I would say is, uh, if you want to learn real stuff, I'll teach it to you at the end of the course, after we're done learning the easy stuff first. <laughs> and if you really, really want to learn the real stuff, you can take the 106L class that's offered right now, and they do the real collections in depth. So it's not impossible for you to learn this stuff in this uh, university if you want to. But we think our collections are better for learning. They're simpler. They have better error messages and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of these collections now and how you might use them in a program. So the first collection I want to show you is called a vector. Vector is sometimes called a list or an array list. If you did Java and used array list, vector is like almost identical to array list. If you come from JavaScript, it's a lot like an array square bracket. It's a lot like that. So a vector is a collection of elements that have indexes that start with 0. The cool thing about a vector is that it can change size. You can add things to it, and it'll grow. You can remove things from it, it'll shrink. In some languages like Java, there's a collection called an array that is a fixed size. You can't change the size of it. Vector overcomes that limitation. If you come from JavaScript, the built-in arrays in JavaScript resize, so you're, you're good to go. A vector is declared by writing the word vector, and then in brackets you put what type of elements you're going to store in the list. 
So in this case, I'm going to have a list of integers, a list of ints. You give the thing a, a name, a variable name, and then if you know what the element values are, you can just write them in curly braces like that, and then those, give them the first five index, zero through four. Or you can build up the contents of the vector over time. You can construct a new vector with no elements like I did there, a vector of strings called names, and then you can add and do other methods to grow the contents of the vector. So I add Stu, I add Marty, I insert Ed, I can grow the thing as the program is going along. Okay? So that's what a vector is. Again, if you come from Java, the syntax is a little different. In Java, you'd say, like, array list of strings, names, equals new array list of strings, or something like that. You don't have to say equals new C++. You just declare it, semicolon, list is built. It's existing, it's empty, it's ready to use. Okay? <coughs> So why don't we use arrays? A vector is basically an array. Short answer, arrays blow in C++. <laughs> Taking a cue from a certain famous person, the array is a shithole data structure <laughs> in C++. Oh, too soon. <laughs> Let's never speak of that again. Um, <clears throat> Uh-oh, I offended people. Um, arrays in C++ are bad. They don't work very well. They don't have very much functionality. If you do something wrong, it doesn't help you fix it. It just causes very strange bugs. In particular, C++ has this feature that's called, uh, it doesn't do bounds checking. So if you make an array of size five and you go to element six or seven or eight or a thousand, it lets you, even though there is none. It just goes to whatever would have been in that memory and says, here you go, <laughs> and it gives it to you. And so that could be garbage or it could crash or all kinds of bad things. So arrays are bad, we don't like them. Vectors avoid some of that. We're not going to use arrays. Uh, later in the class, we might use arrays a little bit. But anyway, there are arrays in C++. They suck. We're not going to use them. So here are some of the methods the vectors have. You can add elements. You can add method or the plus operator. You can remove things. You can clear things out. You can set and get the value at different indexes. You can print them using uh, the less than less than operator or to string method. There's lots of different. So basically, if you use ArrayList in Java, it's almost exactly the same set of methods. So that's pretty cool. So, so like back to my, um, my file program here, you have to include, bless you, vector.h. But you could do something like, hey, I want to store all these tokens. You can say vector string all words. And then as you read each word, you can do all words.add word or token or whatever I called it. You can read every single word in and store it in a vector. And then when you're done, you could say, here they are, colon, all words, handle. And it prints all of them in a big list. So I have the words. I can loop over them. I can look at them. I can sort them. I can do all kinds of cool stuff. They're stored in a list now, right? OK? Bunch of methods. Mostly, I wouldn't say they're very confusing if you've used a structure like this before. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on each one. Uh, more documentation on them on the class website. If you click the Stanford C++ library link, there's links to documentation about all this stuff if you have curious curiosity about them. Um, if you want to loop over the elements of a vector to do something to each one or examine each one or print each one, here are some ways you can do that. One is you write a for loop that goes from zero to size of the vector. Because you know the first index is number zero and the last index is like size minus one. So if you go less than size, it goes up through size minus one, which is what you want. So loop over the elements, go to element i and print element i. You'll notice that you say names bracket i inside the body of that for loop. In Java, do you remember if you use an array list, how do you access the element of your index? Do you remember? You have to say dot get. If you don't come from, if you come from AJ, it's okay. Um, but yeah, in Java, you have to call this method named get to access the contents at an index. In C++, you can just use the brackets, just like you do with strings and any other type of data, which is kind of cool. OK, so you can print the elements. If you want to loop backwards over a vector, you can just do that with different boundaries on your loop, right? You start at size minus 1, you go down to 0, you print names i, it'll print the elements in the reverse order. There's also something called a, a for each loop. This syntax here basically says, I want to loop over all the elements of that vector, and as I process each element, I want to store it as a string variable called name. So then for each name in the names vector, I want to print that name. So that syntax is kind of cleaner. You don't have to use all the indexing and for loop header syntax and stuff. It only works if you're going start to end. It doesn't work backwards or whatever. It just, if you want to loop over them from the start to the end, that's the most common pattern people want. So that short syntax helps you write that pattern more easily. 
my general rule is if I can use that last syntax, I do. But if not, I use the other ones, right? That's how I think of it. And I think uh, Java and JavaScript both have that kind of enhanced short for loop style in them, right? If you add and remove things from a vector, the vector shifts the contents to make room. So this is also like the array list in Java or whatever. Uh, if you say insert at index 2, the value of 42, mm -hmm. it moves the elements over to make room, and then it puts the 42 at index number 2. So you get the picture on the top right there. So if you want to change the value from 9 to 42 without adding anything, you can say set. You can say dot set mm -hmm. 2 comma 42. But inserts, it shifts things over. That's cool. It makes room. Also, similarly, if you remove an element and a given index, in the process of deleting it, it slides everybody else over to cover up the spot where the removed element used to be. One thing we'll talk about later in the course is that this shifting takes time. And if you have a really big vector and you remove something early in the vector, it has to do a lot of work to do all that shifting. We'll talk about that later. It's, uh, we'll talk about efficiency kind of next week and the week after. But this is useful behavior. It's important to know that the vector does this. Um, so I only wanted to briefly touch on vector. I'm going to come back to vector next week. But I wanted to show you two collections today, this one just quickly. And the next, next one I want to show you is called a grid. You'll use the grid more on your homework. So that's why I want to spend the rest of class talking about grid. A grid is basically a two-dimensional vector, a 2D array, a two-dimensional rectangular structure for storing data. So if you declare a grid, just like a vector, you put those brackets of saying what type of elements you want to store in the grid. And then when you construct it, or later, you have to specify the size in rows and columns. There's a resize method if you want to resize later. But you say the number of rows, comma, the number of columns. So this is three rows. Rows go down, four columns. The columns go across. And then if you want to set or get the value at a given index, you use two sets of square brackets. So the first bracket is the row, and the second bracket is the column. Uh, Sometimes people get the indexes mixed up, I guess, because the, the first index is like the row, so the second index is the column. So it's, if you're thinking more like x, y, then it's more like y is the first index and x is the second index. But I just try not to think of it as x, y. I try to think of it as row, column. So anyway, um, here's a short syntax for declaring a grid. If you already know what values you want to store in there, you can do it this way. Or you can store each individual element using that bracket syntax like I've got up higher on the slide. So why do you want this when you have vector? Well, sometimes you want to store a two-dimensional thing. You want to store a list of students and their homework grades, or you know, whatever. Some data is two-dimensional. It might be xy coordinate data, something like that, right? So vector is one-dimensional. A grid is two-dimensional. Some students ask, like, well, could I use a vector of vectors instead of a grid? Yeah, I guess so. But I mean, a grid is sort of like a short form of that. And it has some convenient syntax and methods that are helpful for this style of problem. So I think a grid, if you want two-dimensional stuff, I think you mostly want a grid. Um, here are the methods that a grid has. Mostly you create one of a given size and you go access the indexes. But there's also some helpful methods, like there's an inbounds method. You're saying, is this index within the boundary of the grid or not? If you access an index out of bounds, it'll crash your program with an error message. We'll throw an exception. You can ask for the number of rows and columns. You can resize the grid. You can print the grid out. There's lots of fun stuff you can do with grids. Um, if you want to loop over the contents of a grid, you know, there's different ways you can loop over things. I talked about vector. You can loop from the start to the end. You can loop from the end to the start, et cetera. If you want to loop over a grid, the most common ways you might want to do that would be row major or column major. Row major would be, if you look at the picture there, it's sort of top left to right, and then go down one, left to right, and then go down one, left to right. That's called row major order, where the rows are the, the primary uh, index. And the other order you might want is column major order, where you move over the first column, and then you go to the right. And you move over the second column, and you go to the right, and so on. So if you want to loop in row major order, you basically have an outer loop over the rows, an inner loop over the columns, and then in the body, you do something with that cell. Or if you want to do row major order, you can just use that enhanced uh, syntax loop, the short syntax. If you don't care about the index itself, you can just use that enhanced loop. Um, if you want to go column major, you just invert the order of loops. So now you're looping for each column, I want to go down the rows. For the next column, I want to go down the rows, and so on. Right? Nested loops. Nested loops and grids are best friends. Um, if you want to pass a collection as a parameter, whether it's a vector or a grid or any other collection in C++, collections can be big, bulky things. 
store a lot of elements inside, they take up a lot of memory. We learned last time you can pass things by value, you can pass things by reference. Passing them by value makes a full copy of the thing that you're passing. Making a full copy of a collection is slow. We don't really like to do that. So we pass collections by reference. There's also a keyword in C++ called const, which means constant, which means you can't modify the values in the collection. You can only look at them. So read only. So sometimes we declare a parameter as being const if we don't want the function to modify the value of the parameter. So I want to ask you for each of these two things, what's the best style of passing it as a parameter. How about the first one? If you're going to compute the sum of the elements in a grid of integers, which of the four do you think is the best? Who's brave and wants to, wants to help me out with that? What do you think and why? Um, in the back there, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I said um, reference with the ampersand because we don't want to copy it. And const because we're not going to change it. We're just going to look at the numbers to add them up to get the sum. So I think you're right. I think de const reference grid is the best way. You're inverting the contents of a grid. Maybe you're flipping it around another way or something like that. How do you pass that one? Which of the four do you think is the best? Give your hand up there. Uh, I have a oh, okay, sure. Sorry, why is the ampersand what? Why is the ampersand there? The ampersand really indicates a reference parameter. So by passing by reference, it means we're going to share the grid from main to this function rather than making a copy of it. We don't want to make a copy because it could be made in both key and one. Share the reference to the grid. It's about inverting a, a matrix. Which one? What do you say? B? Yeah, I think so. We still want to pass it as a reference with the ampersand, but it's not constant because we want to change the grid. We want to invert the grid. You could also imagine a version of this where you make a new grid, which is the inverted version of the original, and you return that. But more often, we modify in place the collection passed to us. So that would be this B answer that you said. I think you're right. Yeah. OK, great. So um, I don't think I have time to do this exercise. Uh, I wanted to do a problem with you guys about writing all the places that a knight can move on a chessboard. Um, I don't want to keep you late, especially not on a Friday. So let me just check one thing. Um, do, 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 do. Let me find something here. Oops, no, I don't have it. OK. Um, wait, let me go back here for a second. Oops, where did I go? OK, so here's what I'm going to do. Since I've got a couple minutes left, I want to just briefly tell you what the first homework assignment is. It's called The Game of Life. Uh, let's see, how do I open it? Hold on a sec. You know what I'm scared of is that it's going to make me do that two-factor authentication thing. <laughs> oh, God. I hate that just as much as you do. Please, please, please. Oh, no. OK, cross your fingers. No two-factor, no two-factor, no two-factor, no two-factor. Oh, shoo. OK. Uh, the assignment's called Game of Life. There's a link to a zip that you download and unzip and you work on in Qt Creator. There's also a demo you can download and run, which is a working solution. So you can try it out and see how it works in addition to looking at this spec. The game of life is a game where you have these little cells on a grid. You have little cells on a grid like this. It use a grid collection to do this. And what happens is over time, the cells grow and live and die based on certain rules. The rules have to do with how many neighbors a cell has. So if a given cell has zero neighbors or one, it dies. If it has two or three neighbors, uh, wait, I don't want to get the rules wrong. If it has zero or one neighbors, it dies. If it has two neighbors, it stays the same. If it has three neighbors, it'll come to life. If it has more, it'll die. So kind of like you, you loop over this grid, and for each cell, you look at how many neighbors the cell has. You look at around it and see how many neighbors it has, and based on that, Cells are born and they die. And you animate this over time on the screen. So the little cells make little patterns and clusters and grow and shrink and die. And depending what the initial state of the grid is, it produces these cool patterns when you run the program. So the goal of this assignment is I make you read in the grid from a file storing its initial state. The input file looks like this. Five rows, nine columns. Here's the initial state. Those are the little cells. And now after you read that from the file using what you learned today, you store it in a grid, and then you loop over it repeatedly, updating the cells to draw the new state of the game. 
So that's our first assignment. Uh, I'm going to stop there. Please have a wonderful weekend and uh, sign up for your section by Sunday. I'll see you on Monday or on Wednesday. Thanks.